glitch. Um, my name is Soraya Ismail. I'm from the International Islamic University, Malaysia, and I will be your MC for this particular breakout room. Now, it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you to the 2021 virtual 3MT competition. And this today, ladies and gentlemen, is the national level. What is happening this morning is that we will be going through the semi final rounds for the 3MT. Later on today will be the final round of the national level 2021 virtual 3MT competition. Ladies and gentlemen, this room is the social science room. With us here today are 16 participants who will be presenting their pre-recorded virtual uh, videos and they will be judged by three judges. Please allow me to introduce three of our judges. Our first judge is Professor Dr. Salamia A. Jamal. She is from the Department of Hotel Management, Faculty of Hotel and Tourism Management, UITM Pucha Alam Campus. Please welcome Professor Dr. Salamia. Prof, are you there? Yes, Thank I'm you, here. Prof. Thank you. Now, for the second judge, I would like to welcome Dr. Shahira Abdul Shuko from the Faculty of Sharia and Law, University Science, Islam, Malaysia. Welcome, Dr. Shahira. Are you there, Dr. Shahira? Yes, I am. All right. Wa alaikum salam, bro. And lastly, our third judge is Yang Barusha, Dr. Noor Azlina Binti Arifin from the Commercialized Commercialization Division, Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation, MOSTI, Malaysia. Please welcome Yang Barusha, Dr. Noor Azlina. Are you there, doctor? Thank you, Sama. All the best. All right. Very nice. It's very nice to see all of you on screen. I would love to have been in a true area where all of us can interact. But here, um, we have to embrace the new norm. We have to learn to adapt and adopt really, really fast in order to move on with life. So ladies and gentlemen, um, there are 60 participants and this um, social science will be divided into three rounds. The first round comprises of five participants, second round five, and the third round, there will be six participants. For each round, the judges will take time to deliberate a winner for each round. At the end of when all the 16 participants have presented, the judges will then make one judge's choice. So at the end of the day, there will be four winners from the social science categories. All the winners will be announced um, later on this afternoon at the start of the final round. Then all the winners from um, each categories, um, the videos will be represented um, at the final round and then the grand winners will be um, announced later on today. There will be no question and answer session for this afternoon. Now, before we start, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to ask all of you to mute your microphone to ensure the smooth flow of um, today's program. All right, um, I think we are ready to start with our first round. So ladies and gentlemen, I would like to start the ball rolling with round one. But before I do that, please allow me to read some of the um, basic um, judging criteria for the three MT competition. Now there are two main rubrics for this competition. The first rubric is for comprehension and content. First, with regards to comprehension and content, the presentation must provide clear background and significance to the research question. Secondly, the presentation must clearly describe the research strategy design and results finding of the research. And finally, the presentation must clearly describe the conclusion, outcome, and impact of the research. For the second category of rubric, which is engagement and communication, the oration must be delivered clearly 
and the language must be appropriate for a non-specialized audience. Second, the PowerPoint slide must be well-defined and enhance the presentation. And lastly, the presenter must convey enthusiasm for his or her research and capture and maintain the audience's attention. All right, ladies and gentlemen, now that we've introduced our judges and we know what the criteria is for judging for the three empty competition, let's start the ball rolling with the first presentation. The first presenter for round one is Sister Nora Shikin Abdul Malik from University Technology Mara UITM. And the title of her presentation is Winning the Hearts of Many Through Metaphors in Islamic Da'wah and Gender Perspective. Please welcome. Doctor, I can't hear the voice. Yeah, same here. We, no voice. And we will restart. I'm sorry about that. Do you have kids who are at the face of asking tons of questions? Well, I have one. As a good parent, I'm trying my best to answer all of the questions. But if the questions related to something that is complex or abstract, I have to simplify it to something that is more familiar to her. For instance, when explaining about sin, an immoral act that is condemned by God, to my five-year-old daughter, I describe sin as dirt. And whenever we commit a sin, it's like we're tainting our heart with dirt. Here, I'm using a metaphor that can help to simplify complex ideas to something that people can relate to. Metaphor is a way how people see the world. It's also a powerful tool because it sends a powerful message. Martin Luther King effectively used metaphors like shackles and chains to describe discrimination in I Have a Dream speech that has captured the heart of America and even the world. Interestingly, Men and women use metaphors differently in public speeches. The past research on speeches of famous politicians showed differences in terms of masculinity versus femininity elements. But these was never studied in non-political contexts like in Islamic da'wah. Thus, my research looks at how two prominent Muslim preachers, Numan Ali Khan and Yasmin Mujahid, in using metaphors. From the numerous speeches that were analyzed, I found that Yasmin's choice of metaphors had more inclination of femininity, like nature, weather, and domestic chores metaphors. Meanwhile, Numan's had more inclination towards masculinity, for instance, war, sports, and hunting metaphors. These findings were in line with past research that showed gender-suited speeches gained better acceptance. For instance, Hillary Clinton had inclination of masculine metaphors, but she was scorned, criticized, and even lost a presidential election. This suggests that male speakers should stick to masculine metaphors and female speakers should remain using feminine ones. My findings can help script writers, preachers, leaders, and even politicians in making good decisions on the choice of metaphors based on their gender. A wise choice will lead to greater public acceptance and can win people's hearts. If I can simplify a complex idea to my five-year-old daughter while printing a long-lasting image to her memory, imagine what a metaphor can do when it's used effectively in public speeches to thousands or even millions of people out there. Winning the hearts of people equate power. And if one is wise enough in the choice of metaphors, he or she can conquer the world and the value is priceless.
Thank you very much for the, from the first presenter, Sister Nora Shikin. We would like to move on to our second presenter. Our second presenter, the name of our second presenter is Brother Muhammad Faiz bin Nur Azman Amrullah. He is from University Kebangsaan Malaysia UKM and the title of his presentation is Mastery of Malay Idioms via SEM and BEZA. Please welcome. Cakar ayam, or in English, it means poor handwriting. Kaki ayam refers to barefoot, and kaki botol refers to alcoholics. These are examples of idioms that are commonly used by the Malays. But do you know that idioms are difficult to teach, especially to primary school students? They always ask these questions. Teacher, why chicken, why not cat? Why legs and why not hands? The students have problems to understand the figurative meanings of idioms. What would you do if you are in the teacher's shoes? How do you explain this to your students? Or do you simply ask your students to memorize? It's challenging, isn't it? Hence, more innovative approaches need to be explored to teach idioms and enhance primary school students' interests. My study develops a module that consists of semantic and differentiation instruction in Malay Pengajaran Terbeza. I named this module Sembeza. In this module, the semantic approach guides the teachers to explain the meaning of the phrases in idioms. Next, teachers elaborate on the figurative meanings of the idioms, then the teachers relate the idioms with the context of Malay minds. Let's take Chakar Ayam as example. First, teachers explain the meaning of the idioms which refers to poor handwriting. Then, teachers describe the nature of chicken scratching the ground in search of food which causes the soil to scatter. Therefore, this resembles a messy handwriting. Then, to relate the idioms with the Malay minds and culture, the teachers explain the context of the Malays living in the village where chicken breeding was a common activity those days. They created the idioms based on what they had experienced in the early days. Another challenge that teachers encounter is to teach idioms to mixed ability classrooms. So, this is where the differentiation instruction approach is useful. This approach requires teachers to identify students' readiness, interests, and learning profile. This help teachers to innovate teaching strategies that match with students' cognitive level. In a nutshell, this module called Sembeza is unique in such a way it integrates semantics and differentiation instruction to help teachers in teaching Malay idioms in new interactive approach. So teachers, Every time you want to teach Malay idioms, always remember some beza. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Muhammad Faiz. So it's some beza and not S E M B E Z A. So it's some beza. It's going to be a new approach for me to teach the younger ones at home then. Ladies and gentlemen, let's move on to our third presenter. Before we start, I would like to remind all audiences that um, the video submitted to the organizers, the volume is pretty soft. So I would advise, I would like all audience, the audience to increase their personal volume um, on their devices to ensure you can enjoy and understand the presentation. So let's start the ball rolling. Our third presenter is, is Ms. Ng Yen Pin. She is from University Malaysia Sabah. The title of her presentation is The Meaning of Work. Please welcome. Eminem once said, look, if you had one shot or one opportunity to seize everything you ever wanted, would you capture it or just let it slip? We only live once, and if you are given a choice, do you choose for a job that pays lucratively and titles but meaningless, or a 
a job that gives you a purpose of life? Tourist guides, the real ambassadors for any countries. With just one opportunity, one time to deliver their best shot, they translate and explain a country's culture and history for tourists with a great sense of pride. These factors might be the reasons why individuals continue to guide even at a senior age and never retire. Hence, most of us would say being a tourist guide is a pretty meaningful career. But what if I say that it is not what they do or even how they do it, but how they think about it that gives them purpose? My research is about the meaning of work. It is a cognitive system of how meaning is constructed when an individual interacts with the world. My research looks at the tripart type of orientation model. First, job orientations, when people see work as a means for money. Second, career orientation, a position that allows advancement and growth, while calling is when you feel your work is connected to your purpose and values. However, gaps remain in the literature about the processes behind the formations of work orientation. Using a mixed method approach with an exploratory sequential research design, this study explores the life of tourist guide. Look at this slide and imagine, has it ever crossed your mind that the nature of the close interactions with tourists inspires the work orientations of tourist guides? This is an interesting application to explore and examine the meaning-making process of how this interaction shapes their meaning of work as a job, career, or calling. Attribution theory is applied to analyze qualitative data to understand how and which work orientations develops by interviewing tourist guides on critical incidents. Findings will be used to expand the meaning of work instrument and our understanding of work orientation. This study also expands the applications of attribution theory to understand how the interaction between tourist guides and tourists informs their work orientation. Tourism employees should provide excellent customer service. My study aims to find clearer answers to job, career, or calling. The future of tourism will depend on those who are simply the best, better than all the rest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Ng. Um, for the judges, if you would like to review the videos, um, you can do so during your deliberation stage and um, the videos are with you, uh, will be given to you later on during the intermission. So fear not uh, or worry not, Ms. Ng, you will be fairly judged later on. Moving on to our next presenter, our fourth presenter. Um, she is Ms. Yung Su Mei and from University Pendidikan Sultan Idris. She will be presenting about design and development of this calculia instrument for this calculic pupils. Please welcome. Imagine every single day, no matter where you go, what you are doing, you are always be surrounded with symbols which you are not recognizing them. Those symbols are like dancing on the wall, on the clock, in the screen, or even on so many sideboards, on the roads, and in the markets. Imagine when you want to buy things, the numbers and prices confusing you so much, making you have no idea on how much to pay, how many to buy, and you don't even recognize which direction to find your car in the car park after you have done with your groceries. These are the problems facing by individuals with dyscalculia in their everyday livings. Pupils with dyscalculia, if they were not detected during their childhood or school age, they will continue to be left out or even be labeled as stupid or lazy. Do you know that pupils with dyscalculia should be detected as early as possible? This is to ensure that Proper intervention could be carried out in order to assist these pupils to overcome their difficulties in arithmetic. In my study, I am going to design and develop a dyscalculia instrument for pupils with dyscalculia. Since the number sense among pupils with dyscalculia is underdeveloped, 
The intervention instrument that I am going to design and develop is based on triple code model by Dahin in year 1992 and framework of this calcula by Jerry in year 2004. Number sense is an inborn ability to understand, relate, and connect numbers. It is a group of skills that allow pupils to work with numbers. However, pupils with this calculia have a relatively low number sense if compared with typical pupils and their peer friends. The skills in number sense foundation included subitizing, counting, addition, subtraction, place value, estimation, max memory, speed of working, ascending order, descending order, classifying, and patterns. This discalculate instrument consisted of a teacher's manual, pupil's exercise book, and a discalculate game. It is believed that by mastering in these core skills, the difficulties facing by pupils with this calculia will be able to be minimized and hopefully help those who are struggling with numbers, arithmetics, and mathematics in their every single day. Thank you very much, Ms. Jung, for the presentation. The ability to understand numbers and the ability to count is a basic skill that is much required in our daily lives, especially. Moving on to our fifth presenter. Our fifth presenter is Brother Bang Bang Henki Rainanto, and he is from University Tun Hussein on Malaysia. The title of his presentation is Green Marketing Mix as a Solution to Achieve Sustainable Industry Performance in the hospitality industry. Please welcome. Five years ago, I discovered and was surprised that the city I lived in 15 years ago and two other neighboring cities suddenly had flooding disaster. Just imagine, a city located in Highland had been flooding frequently for the last 10 years. Why is it so? One of the main reasons is because the city are overcrowded as a popular tourist destination. Millions of tourists flock every year and thousands of hotels are flourishing like a mushroom. The number of hotels in three cities alone make up about 44% from the total of 38 cities in the Java province. Do you think with the flourishing of the hotel are destroying the environment which later affect the tourism industry? My study aims to propose an environmental parameters with a green marketing mix to rejuvenate a sustainable performance for tourism industry. What is green marketing mix? Green marketing mix is a way to market a product or service while maintaining the environment and without it, you know, what will happen. A set of questionnaires were distributed to 228 hotel managers. In finding the relations between the environmental management system, pro-environmental behavior, and green marketing mix that can affect sustainable industry performance. Using the Smart PL as version 3, 17 connection of environmental parameters hypothesis were discovered. The result of analysis revealed that 14 hypotheses are accepted and only three hypotheses are rejected. It is very interesting to discover that all flow connections with the green marketing mix are accepted. This means the green marketing mix strategy fully support a sustainable performance for the hotel industry. The best recommendation that is found from this study is green marketing mix should be a policy for the future for the tourism industry players, for the association, and also for the government. Ladies and gentlemen, therefore, 
by including green marketing mix in any policy, a positive contribution can be made in rejuvenating a sustainable tourism. And perhaps there will be no more floods in this beautiful land. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brother Bamba. A sustainable tourism is very much the way to go in this day and age in order to live in, co in a cohesive manner between um, the local, the local um, community, tourist and economy. Ladies and gentlemen, with that marks the last presenter for round one. Judges, if you may, could you please move to the judging room for social science in order to deliberate one winner for round one. If judges, could you press the blue button at the bottom of your right screen? Sorry, not the blue button. Don't leave the room, sorry. Please press the breakout room, the four I, the, uh, icons with the four squares and select the judging room for social science. Meanwhile, this room will take a five minutes break um, while the judges are in the judges deliberation room. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. See you back in five minutes for round two. are a place of accomplishments. From humble beginnings, we have broken barriers and records. From the rawness of basic knowledge, we have instilled values. Values that inculcate the blossoming of minds and the bestowing of virtue. Our accomplishments have touched the lives of so many. For indeed, our infusing of virtue with knowledge has been the key to our success. Why are we always striving? Why do we keep pushing the boundaries? Why do we constantly try to bring out the best in each of us? Because here, no matter where you're from, you are accorded the same right to succeed. We want them to build a better future where good is not just created, but sustained. We stand for excellence in our students, shaping their values and developing the world. We strive for inspiration in our graduates, inspiring their dreams into reality. We want to go beyond the imaginable and bring out virtue beyond any barriers. To improve the quality of life everywhere, physically and spiritually. environment for all students, offering a wide variety of amenities in the pursuit of knowledge. Opening avenues to reach the furthest realms of enlightenment. The International Islamic University of Malaysia. The Garden of Knowledge and Virtue.
Selamat datang. Ahlan wa sahlan. Welcome to the International Islamic University Malaysia or IIUM, your garden of knowledge and virtue. IIUM was established on the 20th of May 1983. The philosophy of the university was inspired by the spirit of Tauhid leading towards the recognition of Allah as the absolute creator and master of mankind. IIUM triumphs to lead the way to become the Khalifa of Allah, to expand the culture of Iqra, to fulfill the amanah that is entrusted to us and to realize the meaning of Rahmatan Lil Alamin. IIUM has several campuses spread across several states of Malaysia, offering nearly 200 academic programs in 17 schoolyards and institutes. The main campus is in Gombak, Selangor, covering 700 acres, beautiful architecture with elegant Islamic style buildings. IIUM is blessed with majestic green forested limestone hills and a cool calming river, nature's wonders of flora and fauna, making it a conducive environment for study. KIRKHS is the largest kuliah in the university with more than 5,000 students. It was formed to integrate human sciences and rebel knowledge disciplines. The kuliah offers courses that bridge the divide between Islamic and secular sciences. Other kuliah of IIUM in Gomba campus are Kuliah of Economics and Management Sciences, Ahmad Ibrahim Kuliah of Laws, Kuliah of Engineering, Kuliah of Architecture and Environmental Design, Kuliah of Information and Communication Technology, Kuliah of Education, Center for Languages and Pre-University Academic Development or CELPAT and IIUM Academy of Graduate and Professional Studies. The campus offers complete range of facilities including on-campus housing, a mosque, two state-of-the-art sports complexes with Olympic-sized swimming pools, fully equipped library with more than 2 million printed and digital materials supported by online databases, a medical clinic, convenience stores, a post office, and three Malaysian commercial banks. The Kuala Lumpur campus at Persiaran Duta houses the International Institute of Islamic Civilization and Malay World, or ISTEC. ISTEC aims to proliferate studies on Islamic civilization and Malay world through learning, research and exchange ideas and knowledge. The Kuantan campus is located on 1,000 acres of land just like a garden within a valley surrounded by large greenery. This campus is well equipped with state-of-the-art technology for teaching and learning that offers medical science, pharmacy, allied health sciences, nursing sciences and dentistry courses. The IIUM Medical Center in Kuantan was built on 27.8 acres of land, equipped with 350 beds for patients and supported by more than 133 specialists. The IIUM Medical Center also includes the development of an undergraduate and postgraduate teaching hospital and tertiary level center, complementing the medical and allied health faculty provisions. Another IIUM campus, which is situated in the state of Pahang, is a center for foundation studies, which is located in Gambang. The Pago campus in Johor houses the Kuliah of Languages and Management, or KLM. The population of IIUM is about 26,000 students, 20,000 undergraduates and 6,000 postgraduates coming from 117 countries. To date, IIUM has 90
from University Malaya, and the title of her presentation is Conversations about Sunat Perempuan. Please welcome. <coughs> The flower that you see on my slide is known as bunga telang. Now most of you know that bunga telang has been used to make nasi kerabu. Here's an interesting fact about bunga telang. Scientifically, it is known as Clitoria ternitia. Peculiar, right? Of all things, why Clitoria? Well, it is named that way because of its similarity and likeness to the female genitalia, in particular the clitoris. This brings me to my research topic. Today, let's talk about sunat perempuan. It is also known as female circumcision or female genital cutting. This topic is largely understudied in the Southeast Asian region, and that includes Malaysia. There is very limited data on the practice. So, this is where my research comes in. My research reconciles and bridges the gap between the media's representation of the practice, as well as the community's representation of the practice. I use two types of data. First, I use news articles from mainstream and alternative news sites. And sec secondly, I use focus group discussion with Malay Muslim women from the age range of 20 to 70 years old. I analyze the communication and language aspects of these texts to answer my research questions. I ask, how is female circumcision talked about and represented in the news media? And secondly, how is female circumcision talked about and represented by the Malay Muslim women themselves? So, the news media reveal the different voices and opinions in the news media, whereas the focus group discussions showcase the narratives of lived experiences and realities of Malay Muslim women. So, what have I found so far? The word cloud that you see on my slide shows the 50 most frequently occurring words in my data. There are five key themes underlying the conversations about female circumcision or sunat perempuan in Malaysia. Those five themes are culture, gender, health, human rights, and religion. There are clashing of opinions in the news as well. Everyone is saying different things. The United Nations, the experts, the government. So there is a lack of clarity on the need for the practice. And this lack of clarity is also reflected in the responses we receive by the focus group discussion participants, they too are baffled by the lack of clarity on the practice. So, the recurring topic that also appeared in the focus group discussion is the hygienic benefit of the practice. On the other hand, in the media, there is an oversaturation of the human rights perspective. Clearly, there is something missing here. There is a gap in communication that we need to address. And this is very important because Malaysian doctors are now starting to perform a more invasive form of cutting to the clitoris, according to latest research. So, what does this mean and what is the implication? This means that your daughter could be at risk of injury or complication. And this is why I care about Sunat Perempuan. This is why you too should care about Sunat Perempuan. And this is why we should review and adjust our legislation and policies based on real experiences of Malay Muslim women. And this is why we need to have more open conversations about Sunat Perempuan in order for us to safeguard women's reproductive health. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. An understanding of the practice and understanding of how things are done will only help us move forward to something better. Now let's move on to our second presenter. Her name is Sister Hanis Binti Kamaruddin and she comes from the University of Malaysia, Kelantan. The title of her presentation is Between Self-Perceived Communicative Competence and Demotivation. Please welcome. I'd like you to recall whether you have heard of these phrases before during any speaking activity in your class. Madam, I don't think I can do this speaking task. Madam, is it okay if I do this speaking activity with my best friend but not with everyone else in the class? These are some of the common things that you will usually hear from your students whenever you ask them to participate in any speaking activity. The big question is, why do our students keep on having this thought in their mind? Am I good enough to say something? This has interested me to dig deeper as throughout my 14 years of teaching experience, I have seen students who are very good in writing, they can even get good results, but when it comes to speaking, zip, they are not willing to speak, be it the good or the weak students, as if they don't believe that they are good or competent enough to speak. Whereas, with at least 13 years of learning English experience from kindergarten until university, we expect our students to be confident, 
outstanding, but the reality is not. Whenever we ask them to come to the front to say something, they will start to have fast breathing, even up to hyperventilating just with the thought of having to speak. Aren't you curious, my dear educators, what have caused the students to be like this? Now, instead of looking at ways to motivate the students to speak better, my study is going to focus on the darker side of motivation, which is demotivation. Are there factors that could reduce the student's motivation level in this situation? Factors such as the lecturers themselves. Maybe the lecturers always shouted or got angry at the students. Or could it be because of the class environment, which is not welcoming enough for the students to feel comfortable to speak? Or could it be because of the student themselves? Maybe they have a negative attitude towards English and think English is not important for their future. These are known as demotivating factors. In my study, by doing survey on the students, I believe we could examine thoroughly on these demotivating factors as they might have significant influence on the way the students perceive themselves whether they are competent enough to speak. As a result, I hope the extended model on communicative competence and demotivation would benefit not only those in UITM but also other learning institutions as well, especially in producing graduates who are not only good in speaking but most importantly, competent enough to speak in any situation they are in. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sister Hanis. Uh, a competent speaking skills, as a competent level of speaking, be it in English or in Malay, is very, very important in order to convey messages, especially when um, in any forms of and any levels of communication. Now we move on to our third presenter. Her name is Miss Jaya Sri Mandi from University Technology, University Tenaga National. The title of her presentation is Measure Untouchable and Fine Bonding. Please welcome. Love has no physical appearance, but two souls can feel and creates a soulful relationship. Similarly, coronavirus, which created this pandemic and even being a gossip among kids is untouchable. Although we can't touch the virus, the impact leads to measure in terms of death and positive cases on daily basis. Due to this pandemic, we are mentally and economically affected. Pity the companies and the workers who are declared bankruptcy and lost their jobs. At this stage, many companies are selling their properties for survival and to pay their debt. Most of us are willingly sell our lands, house, cars, etc. with the belief that there is an existence of knowledge and innovation in every single human being which are priceless with that we can get back all the losses so i would like to put my shoes as the owner of one of the malaysian company as a motivation i will utilize my existing employees knowledge and money to get back all the losses and to rebuild my empire at this point i've innovated my ideas <clears throat> and advertise as much to public to increase my company's performance Oh my God, how do I measure and value those things so that government won't come after me for not revealing the gist of the success? At this point, my thesis comes in to find measuring models to measure the knowledge, innovation, other touchables and their relationship towards the company's success. Since our seniors already created some measuring models, so I just extended those existing models to ease measurement. The uniqueness of my idea is I can measure the power and strength of my own board members and their innovative contribution towards the success. Thus, I expect each board member's characteristic will play a role towards company's performance, but I would not say a company's sustainability is solely depend on the innovation thinking. So as a conclusion, measuring untouchables will show greater performance of a company with a power pack organization, even 
if it is not with higher performance the company may still sustain with a lower income so measure the untouchables and find your bondings towards company performance my research will help the owners to solve problem to measure the untouchables and find their bonding through my innovation therefore do measure and get listed in bursa malaysia with a greater company performance thank you thank you very much ms jayasri i certainly hope that um, the tool that you are developing um, would help many people or many businesses out there to lift themselves up to greater height the only way to go for most businesses today is up because they most have hit rock bottom thank you very much ms jayasri our next presenter is Sister Nur Marina Binti Abdul Rahman. She comes from University Pendidikan Sultan Idris UPSI. The title of her presentation is Assessing Students' Math Process Skills. Please welcome. Having students with good grades in maths is always a blessing for both teachers and parents. But learning maths is not just about getting the right answer. Tone of studies showed that the activities such as memorizing or even drilling students with set of questions will help them to pass the exam. But will these activities actually help our students to think mathematically? My research takes a slightly different approach and looks into our students' math thinking, known as maths process skills. Uh, but how can we measure thinking? I go through new curriculum standards, models, theories, and also finding from previous studies to come out with a rubric which consists a list of criteria to measure students' math process. Students with these skills should be able to process information to find a connection, then represent their understanding into words, numbers, or even drawing, uh, then communicate about their solution. Practice reasoning, plan and execute strategy, and of course, solve the problems. I said about answering two questions. First, is instrument use shows any evidence of proven, valid, and reliable tools? And second, what are the level of our Form 1 Maths process skills? A set of problem solving and reflective writing tasks were developed related to Maths Form 1 topic and validated by nine experts along with a rubric which analyzed using many facet rush model. I used survey method with 407 for my students as respondents and also seven teachers as writers to score a student response based on the rubric. In this task, students are not just asked to solve the problems but they are also required to explain the how, what, which, and why of the answers. The result analysis showed that both instruments had high content validity and indicates good construct validity based on the RASH model analysis. More than 50% of the respondents who possess math process skills are at the average level, while only about 2.46% of the respondents who succeed to achieve the excellent level. My research challenge is to encourage our students to uh, explain their thinking. Lots of students who are able to give the right answer with the correct procedure, but struggle to express their thinking into words or give justification of their decision. But it's okay. At least now, we already have a proven, valid and liable tools to begin with. We are getting there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sister Noor Marina. Sometimes as a teacher, it is not the end point, but it is the process that we are interested to figure out how the students get to the end point. So ladies and gentlemen, let's move on to our last presenter for round two. Good morning. 
Our last presenter is Miss Ho. Sorry, our last presenter is Miss Ho Chai Singh. She is from University Technical Malaysia, UTEM, and the title of her presentation is A Personal Learning Environment Framework to Enhance Communication Skills Among Undergraduate in Malaysia. Please welcome. To the Honourable Judges, when was the last time you communicated with someone? Was it five seconds ago or was it five days ago? So communication is a very important process. My research is about a personal learning environment framework to enhance communication skills among undergraduates in Malaysia. I'm very sure everyone knows about the importance of communication for undergraduate students, right? Nowadays, it is very difficult for undergraduates to find jobs upon graduation due to their inability to speak fluently in English. Now, think about it. If you are the boss, would you want to hire someone who is not fluent in English? Personal learning environment is a growing trend in online education where emphasis on students being able to define their own learning environment. The focus is on self-directed learning, allowing students to take an assignment and research it through both traditional and non-traditional means. Well, personal learning environment involves lifelong learning. That means the learning process does not stop. Whatever that the students have learned in the university will be applicable for them when they go out and work. There are three main elements in my research framework. Number one, learner as socializer. In the learning process, students will need to communicate a lot in the class, which involves a huge amount of communication skills in the class. All the students will have a chance to communicate with their peers in the class using English as they complete the given task. Hence, it will help them to improve their communication skills. Number two, Learner as knowledge developer. In the learning process, students will get to learn new things in the class. Whatever they've learned in the class will be extremely useful to them when they go out and work later. Hence, it will help them to improve their knowledge continuously. Number three, learner as decision maker. In the learning process, students need to make decisions on their own. Students need to know what to do and make a quick decision in the learning process. That is why students will be actively involved as the decision maker. In my study, it is found the knowledge that students have learned in the class is very useful and it really helps the students to improve their speaking and communication skills. I believe that this framework will be beneficial to all undergraduate students. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Ho. Um, communication is indeed very, very important. It is something that we should instill in our students right from um, primary school and all the way up to um, tertiary education or undergraduate level. Um, it is a challenge for all teachers, even for myself, to depolish that skill. So ladies and gentlemen, that was the uh, final presenter for round two. We just listened to five presentation. And again, I would like to invite um, all the three judges to move to the um, social science judging room. And it will take about five minutes or more for the judge just to deliberate the winner for round two. So judges, if you may. And for the rest of us, please stay in this room so we can proceed in the next five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. A greeting of peace and a very good morning. In conjunction with the event today, I would like to touch on three major issues that concerns us, especially at the International Islamic University of Malaysia. This is an university that was established in 1983 that looks forward to the future and try to make meaning of what the future is for us. In conjunction with today's event, 
There are three things that has been happening in this university that promotes the future as far as the university is concerned. We have been, in the last one year, preparing ourselves into a new paradigm of what university looks like and what education looks like given the 21st century. It is called Sajatra Academic Framework. The word Sajatra is a colloquial word that means peace, that means harmony, that means balance, that also means sustainability, a kind of the future that all of us wishes to see in the moment to come. And therefore, this Sajatra Academic Framework lay out what the university needs to do moving forward in changing the paradigm of the education in Malaysia if not worldwide. We are quite concerned of what has been happening in the last few months given the coronavirus pandemic and therefore would want to make adjustment as to how we can accommodate the new challenges of the future so that education continues to be relevant not only for this moment but also for the time to come. And therefore, this framework that we are working on today becomes a kind of a mission for us to define what the future is like as far as the International Islamic University Malaysia is concerned. The framework will serve to be a platform for discussion of what the new generation would want to see in the world that they want to create for themselves. What are the things that we can learn in the past that is no longer considered relevant as far as education is concerned. There are a number of things that we have identified. One of it that comes in very strongly is a question of the orientation of education itself. We believe education today is what I call weird in the context of it is westernized, western-centric, it is economic-centric, it is industrial-led, it is reputational-obsessed, and hence, at the end of the day, it becomes a dehumanizing exercise for many of us. The coronavirus pandemic makes it very clear to us and therefore it becomes incumbent upon us to look at new paradigm to change what has been happening before so that we can have a better and a brighter future moving forward. Therefore, the Sajatra Academic Framework becomes a thinking piece for us. This university will involve itself with discussion with members of the staff, students and indeed the community around us hopefully also a global community that is now here within our uh, ambit in this particular event. Now, from this, we are beginning to look at what the coronavirus has done to many of us all over the world in the context of education. And therefore, we want to look at the coronavirus uh, paradigm, as it were, and how these changes could affect not only Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to round three of the social science category for 2021 uh, 3MT virtual competition. Again, this is the semi-finals round. For round three, there will be six participants. And again, these are all pre-recorded uh, videos that we will view. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's start the ball rolling with our first presenter. Our first presenter is uh, Sister Siti Som Binti Hussein from University of Malaysia Kelantan and the title of her presentation is Strategy Making Profit in Private Education Industry. Please welcome. My God, this month no student come and register at the centre. Even the existing student did not want to join the class. If this happened, my business will out from the market. What should I do? Based on the situation, I can say that the SME did not have the best knowledge about the existing of the business model innovation. Previously, this happened because the SME of private education did not have a knowledge and lack of understanding about business model innovation. So, they are not alert about the existing of business model innovation. Therefore, it is important to understand the business model innovation. Business model innovation is important element to make money, 
by doing things differently, such as unique and creative, by using technology around to making money. This understanding has been come from many industries, including private education industry. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic hit us badly. I believe this is the situation where all the SME in private education industry feel yourself slapped, right? This situation is not new, especially in private education industry, where the SME unable to open the physical store due to restricted movement order from a government to avoid the infection to public. This ongoing situation will lead the SME unable to generate income, unable to grow, fail to maintain a business and finally out from the industry. The implementation of the business model innovation able to help SME in private education, uh, making money, grow and maintain industry by using existing technology and human interaction such as influencer. The influencer is an interaction to influencing future and existing students. The SME can train the influencer based on three criteria, such as knowledgeable, good presenter, and well experienced to enhance knowledge for monetary returns. The implementation of business model innovation, such as technology and influencer, have been successfully implemented by dominant competitor in the private education industry. Interview and observation with them show that a positive mindset play an important role to generate profit, grow and maintain in industry. The benefit is not only to SME in private education industry, but also this become a new model of education for the, for the educator to prepare for present and future times. Thank you very much, uh, Sister Siti Sum. An influencer is very important and it, it, it is a new marketing tool for many industries, not only in the education industry, but especially in other commercial industries as well. Moving on, let's hear what our second presenter has to say. Our second presenter is Sister Intan Shahida Binti Zul Kafa from University Malaysia Pahang UMP. The title of her presentation is Driving the Professional Communication Revolution. Please welcome. Al Moro Lindbergh once said, good communication is just as stimulating as black coffee and just as hard to sleep after. Don't you think it's true? Yes, of course. In fact, your success at getting your point across can be the difference between seeing it during business and missing out on a potential opportunity totally. Hence, it is vital to be able to attain the art of professional communication to achieve goals and be successful. Yet, many fresh graduates in Malaysia lack this secret weapon and blame it fatally on fate when industries do not offer them employment. Little do they know, a string of A's in their schools or a four flat in their degree is just a paper qualification. A paper which is too rough even to use it as a tissue paper to blow our delicate nose. What a joke! To believe it is the only criteria to secure employment. No, 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 don't get me wrong. Of course, it's great to have good grades. Nevertheless, what these graduates need is much more than just good grades. So, what is it? This need is the what I am looking into for my PhD study. I have surveyed and many employees have highlighted that the most vital need and what I mentioned is professional communication skills. In fact, they profess that none 
out of 10 candidates they have rejected often like business skills. To them, communication skills is not just about getting the business done, but it is also important reading the business itself. So, I am here to solve this communication issue and draft the professional communication revolution by going back to the basic, which is developing student communication skills. I will work closely with the Education Ministry to break the chain of claims from the industries to universities, universities to colleges, colleges to schools. This is not a laughing matter. So always, always remember, no matter what job you have in life, your success will be beaten 5% by your academic credentials, 15% by professional experiences, and 80% by your communication skills. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sister Intan Shahida. I am taken aback by the statement that the road to success after get, getting my basic degree, 80% of it depends on the power of the gap, which is how good I can speak. There is obviously some truth in it, hence she is persuading, uh, pursuing her PhD in this area. All the best to you and all the best to the future teachers too. Let's move on to our third presenter. The name of our third presenter is Brother Shahril bin Ramli. He comes from University Putra Malaysia UPM and the title of his presentation is Mastering the Mighty Godzilla, Tun Mahade, the Malaysian Hercules. Please welcome. Have you ever tried persuading anyone with your speech? Greek scholars such as Socrates and Aristotle compared persuasion strategies with monstrous creature, that is with a big head, big body and also a big tail. Now I'm sure you all know Godzilla, right? Okay, now imagine the Godzilla's head, the body and also the tail. Now let us put that monstrous Godzilla aside for a while. According to neo aristotelian criticism, which is the methodology of my research in analyzing speeches, there are three main strategies a speaker can use to persuade his audience. The first one is known as inventio, which is the origination of the ideas. The second one is known as dispositio, the arrangement of the ideas. And the third one is known as illocutio, the style on how the ideas are explained to the audience. Now, let us bring back the Godzilla. Just imagine that the Godzilla's head as the origination of the idea the body as the arrangement of the ideas, and the tail as the style on how the ideas are explained to the audience. Now, my research is set to analyze Ton Mahadev's persuasion strategies in the speeches he delivered during his political hiatus from 2004 until 2018. By using these ancient persuasion strategies, Ton Mahadev managed to grapple all the political odds very much like our legendary Hercules, and emerged as the Malaysian Prime Minister for the second time in 2018. Now, let us all imagine our beloved Ton Mahadev as Hercules, the Greek superhero in controlling the Godzilla. First is with the head, which is the origination of the ideas. Ton Mahadev used a lot of persuasion strategies such as quantification or numbers, facts, and also examples to strengthen the originality of his ideas. Second is the body, which is the arrangement of the ideas. Sometimes Ton Mahade loved to arrange his ideas according to time base. Other times he loved to arrange his ideas according to cause and also effect. And the last one is the tail, which is the style. Ton Mahade loves to repeat his points. And he also loved to use rhyming sentences as well, sharp and precise. Now, why is it important for all of us to know all this? John Mahadev is unquestionably one of the world's greatest leaders. And to be able to understand his persuasion strategies, 
will be the greatest asset for a body of politicians and also commoners like us. Well, you know what they say, tongue is sharper than sword. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Shahril. A very interesting subject that you have picked in order to dissect and understand how his mind works and to try and apply it in our everyday lives in order for us to learn to persuade things. Now, now, now let's move on to our fourth presenter. He is Brother Khairul Anwar Rusli from University Science Islam Malaysia, USIM. The title of his presentation is Just G-R-E-E-N It. Please welcome. My professor once told me that start your research with a question. So let me ask you a simple one. What's your favorite color? Anyone love red? Blue? Or maybe green? I choose green because green is my life. I did research on green practices among small and medium enterprise manufacturers in Malaysia. You know, all these SMEs, small size, limited resources, but still contributed more than 30% to our Malaysian GDP annually. At the same time, they receive almost 80% of environmental protection program budget by the government. But yet, yeah, they are still among the highest contributors of environmental pollution in Malaysia. So after I did numbers of interviews and managed to get over than 200 uh, response from the industry, I can conclude that green could be our possible solution. G. Governance. Most of the environmental regulation in Malaysia are being widely applied for both large and small companies. This is unfair. We cannot simply scale down what being done by large company to small company. We need to have a tailor-made specific environmental regulation governance for all SMEs based on their capabilities. R. Rating. Every company wants to be the best among the best. Implementing green practices require a lot of investment. We should acknowledge and appreciate all this effort by SMEs by introducing a variety of rating, reward and ranking to them. This could be their unique selling point to their customer. At the same time, we can attract more participation from the others. E. Enforcement. We used to remember what happened to Kim Kim River at Pasir Gudang. People said it was lack of monitoring. But the worst thing is, businesses are willing to pay the fine rather than to install environmental pollution control at their facilities. So, we need to enforce heavier penalty to all these environmental pollutants. E. Empowerment. Time is money. We cannot waste any single second in making business decisions. During the interview, many companies reported back to me saying that they face difficulty in getting feedback and response from the authorities, especially when they are dealing with chemical in their production. So why not we give them some sort of empowerment and accountability to make their own business decision faster. And networking. SME couldn't work in silo. We need to match up their strength and also their capabilities so, don't, so that they know each other and they can work together. Networking among SME is important to boost their financial performance and to reduce their environmental impact. Respected judges and fellow researcher, based on my finding, I believe that if we manage to integrate all these five elements into our industrial setting, we can achieve something better in the near future. Moving forward, Green could act as a comprehensive driver for our National Blueprint Framework Strategy in achieving Sustainable Development Goal 2030. So remember, it's no longer just do it. Now is the right time for just green it. Thank you very much, Brother Hyrule Anwar. So just green it in order to achieve sustainable development and to live in, harmo in harmony with the environment and our businesses. Let's move on to our fifth presenter. His name is Brother Omar Abdullah Omar At Alta Mimi, and he is from University Science Malaysia. The title of his presentation is Analyzing the Effects of Using Electronic Indirect Corrective Feedback and Electronic Error Logs on the ESL Student Written Grammatical Accuracy. Please welcome.
Hello everyone, take it easy. I'm not going to correct anyone's grammar. This is just a sweater that can be found online for like a hundred ringgit. However, the grammatical errors of the students is a serious issue that face the students during their academic and professional life. Students need to maintain good grammar if they want to get admitted to any higher educational institution. Also, during their university life, they need to maintain essays that are accurate and uh, error-free. Even after they graduate, future employees need to maintain good grammar to keep their jobs. To solve this problem, several software and tools have been developed. Tools such as Grammarly and Turnitin can be found online uh, easily. But a problem with these tools is that they are very expensive and also they require constant internet access. But what about poor students who cannot afford to pay the subscription fees of these tools and they don't have internet access? What can they do? Who's going to help them? For example, I am an English teacher from Yemen and my, teacher, uh, and my students are poor and most of them cannot afford to pay the subscription fees of these tools. That's why I decided to step in. I am working in developing a low-cost instructional technology tool. This tool will combine three t uh, feedback strategies. I will use a low-cost technology tool, Microsoft Word, to introduce two feedback techniques. They are indirect feedback and error logs. Indirect feedback means the students get an indication of the errors they make without giving them the correct answer. However, they have to figure out themselves. Error logs are tables that show the students' errors in a progressive manner. They are usually introduced whenever the student write writes an essay. These tools have been proved to be working very effectively by their own. However, no one has tested them in combination. I tested them and the results showed that they are very effective in improving the grammatical accuracy of the students. I really want to improve the quality of my students' life. I want them to, to survive their academic and professional life. I don't want them to stay behind just because they cannot afford the subscription fees or they don't have internet access. The results show that there is some hope. That's why I'm going to continue my research. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Brother Omar Abdullah. As a teacher, hope is what we can give our students and with hope we provide guidance as well. Now let's move on to our last presenter. She is Miss Kasturi Lamar, sorry, beg your pardon. She is Miss Kasturi Ra uh, Ramalingam. She comes from University Technology Malaysia, UTM. And the title of her presentation is Speak Better, Mobile Apps Module. Please welcome. Once upon a time, this popular phrase attracts every child's heart. Have you ever wondered why children love stories so much? Well, storytellers around the world are able to turn a frog into a prince and an ugly duckling into a beautiful swan. According to Albert Einstein, if you want clever children, tell them stories. If you want brilliant children, tell them many stories. Fear, lack of confidence and discomfort speaking up in public are some examples of challenges that primary school children face in school. These children often have difficulties in developing their speaking skills. However, speaking difficulties will be reduced by using storytelling as a teaching approach with optimizing digital advancement. The interactive resources found in modern devices are able to provide rich experience in speaking while enjoying the stories. In view of this, I have developed a teaching module by incorporating attractive mobile application that highlights how to present stories more effectively. This module is developed with fun animation, visual and sound effect, background music and also games to inspire children 
grow greater interest in storytelling. As an outcome, this tool definitely would captivate children's mind, increase their creativity, improve their language abilities, and most importantly, enhance their speaking skills. Hence, this module is not only effective teaching guide, it is also an effective tool for the teachers to deliver stories to children. Additionally, teachers and parents can build their own stories by using this module as a guidance. More amazingly, this research product can be delivered even in the absence of the storyteller, allowing every young children to enjoy their stories while enhancing their speaking skills whenever, wherever and however they want. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Kasturi. Um, technology is here to stay, so we, we should embrace technology and make sure that technology will benefit us all. However, there is no way we can substitute the presence of an adult in order to form and shape the child in front of us. Be it a six-year-old child, a 16-year-old child, or a 27-year-old young man in front of us as we teach um, in our daily lives. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the final presentation for round three, which also marks all 16 presentation has been completed in the social science category. Now, the judges will move to the judging breakout room to deliberate the winner for round three, as well as to pick out the judges' choice and extra judges' choice from the social science category. All in all, there will be four winners from the social science category. The winners will be announced later on this afternoon um, at the start of the final round. Ladies and gentlemen, this um, social science breakout room will be closed as the judges migrate to the judges um, breakout room and all of us then would move to the main room. Again, I thank you all for your attention and I thank all the participants for their hard work and for their participation in the 3MT. I wish you all the best and I will see you in the next room. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa Thank you, Doctor. And I would like to contextualize this meeting today is what we call celebrating IIM 2020. Perintah kawalan pergerakan dilaksana di seluruh negara bagi mengekang penularan COVID-19. Perintah kawalan pergerakan mulai 18 Mac 2020 iaitu lusa hingga 31 Mac 2020 di seluruh negara. Let me reassure you as far as I am concerned the situation in the university is well under control.
Universiti Islam Antarabangsa Malaysia UIAM menghasilkan prototip robot yang boleh membantu doktor berdepan dengan pesakit dengan membuat saringan dari jarak jauh. Robot yang diberi nama Medibot dibangunkan pakar robotik kuliah kejuruteraan dan kuliah teknologi maklumat komunikasi. Dilengkapi alat kawalan jauh bervisual, doktor berinteraksi dengan pesakit tanpa perlu bersemuka. Pasukan khas ini terdiri daripada pencarah, pentadbir dan pelajar yang tinggal dan menginap di kampus Gombak. PPE yang dihasilkan akan dihantar ke pusat perubatan UIAM di Kuantan Pahang dan lain-lain hospital yang akan dikenalpasti oleh Malaysian Relief Agency MRA. Sementara itu, Universiti Islam Antarabangsa Malaysia UIAM mencatat sejarah sebagai institusi pengajian tinggi pertama di negara ini tersenarai sebagai finalis untuk dua penganugerahan lestari antarabangsa. Dua anugerah itu adalah anugerah Green Gown Antarabangsa dalam kategori institusi lestari terbaik dunia dan anugerah memanfaatkan masyarakat menerusi program LIGHT.